Tonight we're going to talk about jurisdiction. What is the constitutional authority and who has the true jurisdiction? And where, where in the Constitution is there any right for the feds to say that they own all this land, which they do not? They have control over it. They don't have ownership over it. It's public domain. And I remember years ago dealing with the Forest Service. I used to deal with them all the time because I was in mining when I was a younger man. I still love mining. I think it's a great hobby, a great, great way of life, and, and it produces the resources we need to be strong as a nation. But I used to deal with the Forest Service all the time, and I remember talking with these old guys 25, 30 years ago. It was always public domain to them. It was a public land. It was a public domain. You know, that was our land. It was, it was for the public. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, as time went on, uh, more and more, well, finally it progressed from being public domain and public land to government land in their vernacular. Now, and, and I was shocked when I started hearing them say government land. I'm going, well, where did it, what changed it from being public to government? I mean, where did that happen? I missed something along the way. So anyway, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, we're going to go back in history, and we're going to look at really where is the authority. Who has the authority? Uh, we had our, our former county sheriff here, uh, Bill Gerberson, he had to leave, but jurisdiction is so important, especially for the county sheriff to understand that jurisdiction and for county commissioners to understand that jurisdiction. So I'm not going to spend a lot more time up here. I wanted to put this together because I'm concerned for the long-term future of Josephine County. I want to see us prosperous again. I don't, I don't, the land, it's the land, history of the world, History of the world has always been a struggle and a conflict over who's going to control the resources, who's going to control the land. Always has been, always will be. Nothing's going to change. In fact, I was just reading an article today that there's some resource wars coming up. And if you think that stuff in the Middle East is about human rights and protecting people, I got news for you. It's about oil. Okay? It's about resources. It's just like our struggle out here in the West. Uh, on these, these uh, forests that we have on our counties. Uh, the struggle is not between saving the environment or it's about controlling the resources. It's about who is going to benefit in the long term from this land. Josephine County has tremendous mineral wealth. They have a tremendous amount of minerals. If we were ever, out, ever allowed to produce from the ground again in this county, we'd be prosperous to all get out. We wouldn't have these problems we have today. And uh, I've, I've uh, dealt with the environmental movement for a long time. I've uh, confronted them toe-to-toe, toe -toe, face to face. And it's not about the environment. It's really not about the environment. It's about bringing America down. It's about bringing America down to a third world level. It's a, these guys, these guys I, I call them watermelons because they're green on the outside, but bright, bright red on the inside. And if you really look at, at the environmental movement, <clears throat> they were, at one time in the very beginning, there were some legitimate causes, but now it's just all about stopping people from producing from the ground. When you produce from the ground, you have, you've ever heard of trickle-down economics? Well, first, producing from the ground is trickle-up trickle economics, because when you produce something from the ground, it goes out, creates jobs, 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 jobs. That's why we got to produce from the ground. The, the, the wealth of a nation will be determined by what they can produce, what a person, can, uh, a country can produce from the ground. Why, why is a third world country a third world country? It's because they can't produce. And what are the reasons for a country not being able to produce? It's one of two things. They just don't have the resources, or their government won't let them use the resources. All right? Take Venezuela. They're going through turmoil. Tremendous farmland, tremendous oil reserves, and they're, they're in a civil war right now because they have a government that doesn't allow them to produce from the ground. We're headed that way in America. We're headed right to the same scenario as them, unless enough people, and I'm shocked. I mean, you'd think more people would be interested in the future of Josephine County. Apparently not. But I am, and you guys are, so that's a good thing. Uh, so we're going to talk about resources basically because land is a resource 
And, and it, it is the key to the future of Josephine County. It is really the key to Josephine County. You're, you're not going to take a county that's 73% controlled by government and expect to tax your way into prosperity. We need to figure out how to stand up for our rights as a county, as a people, to get back out of the land and start producing the resources America needs to be free. We used to feed the world. As a nation, we fed the world. Today, we import 40% of our food. Why is that? It's those watermelons again. It's those watermelons. Okay? Uh, we used to harvest vast amounts of timber and have great exports in timber. Why don't we do that? It's those watermelons again. You get the picture? So we you get the picture? So, 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 let's take a delve back into history. Let's look at, uh, at where the jurisdiction and authority really lies. Let's see if we can't take advantage of that to move Josephine County to a more prosperous future. And with that, I'm going to have questions and answers after this. But uh, right now, hold your questions. I'm going to introduce our guest speakers. Lauren? Lauren? And uh, yes. Dennis. And they're going to talk about jurisdiction. And we're all going to get an education. for coming tonight. Can you all hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, I am Loma Horton. It's not my name. Name is the depiction given to property by the owner thereof. Nobody owns me. Loma Horton is who I am. And I've been doing this since 2004. My brother and I both. Um, what you're going to see tonight has come as a result of Rally Around Flag and retired legislator Jeff Krupp. How many of you know Jeff Krupp? Nobody knows him. Okay. Um, Jeff came to one of our liberators classes. We hold them every third Monday at um, Elmer's in Roseburg. And uh, we had a, a young gentleman that night that took this jurisdiction over federal areas within the states, this 1,000 page book here, and synopsized it down into 16 pages. And we had Lance that night talking about it. Jeff came to talk about something on the, the campaign trail, and he realized after listening to this and listening to us for so long, jurisdiction is the answer. So how many of you guys are aware of Natural Resources Director from Apache County, Arizona, Doyle Shamlin? Have you heard of it? Good. It's their county's work that you're going to learn about tonight. It's their work in taking back their lands. They hired Doyle. Five of the county supervisors were all attorneys. Doyle kept presenting all of this law and all of this information in front of them. And uh, so they hired him to become their natural resources director. He is also now county commissioner. His group is called Veritas Research Group. That's what all of these documents here are. These books here are, but um, he delivered the evidence to five county supervisors. They wrote a resolution, and under that resolution, they wrote an ordinance under health, safety, and welfare, which puts the county as the lead agency. So guess what happens when the county writes a resolution under health, safety, and welfare? They become the lead agency. They invite everybody to the table, all what they call the stakeholders, to the table. Those that don't show have no standing. The county determines the agenda. It ensures the cohesion among the agencies that are responsible for implementing the county's decisions. So what Apache County did is they cleaned and logged. Well, actually, excuse me, I got off a little bit here. How many of you are, are, are familiar with the Wildlife Urban Interface? Okay. What Apache County did when they wrote their resolution to take back control of their wildfires and their roads under the Wildlife Urban Interface, and it's the same for here, the counties can log 300 feet back on each side of the road, up to three and a half miles in the Wildlife Urban Interface. That's just to clean it and log it. Can you imagine how much work that would be for Josephine County, for how many years, 
just to clean and log mm -hmm. alongside the roads up to three and a half miles of the wildlife or the interface. <clears throat> Once the county became the lead agency, that eliminated the Equal Access to Justice Act. How many of you know what that is? Okay. That's where the attorneys get paid for suing on your environmental. What it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's written by Congress, and it allows the environmental groups to sue a government agency, a federal agency, not the county agency. But once a county takes lead, lead, um, sorry, lead agency by writing that ordinance, it eliminates the environmentalists from suing. Yeah, you know, they'll say they're going to sue, but what's going to happen? They're going to have to use their own money to come down into state or county court. So it eliminates that. And I will say this, the uh, Ninth Circuit, I believe is what it was, eliminated sue and settle. So now the environmental groups, if they're they have to take it to fruition, they can't settle anymore. So, <clears throat> And with Apache County, Arizona, in Apache County, Arizona, or around Apache County, Arizona, are some of the most egregious environmental groups in Phoenix. And they got on board with this. So why did they get on board? Well, when you start cleaning and logging, what happens? The fauna comes back. The Mexicans spotted out, came back to life. Okay? At that time, when they wrote this ordinance, they had one sawmill one shift, one sawmill with no electricity. 45 days, they had both those sawmills up and running three shifts. At the end of the first year, they had four sawmills running. One of them was a state-of-the-art uh, Vaughan Brothers out of Washington portable sawmill. And now, as of today, they have a pallet mill, a pellet mill, and a biomass mill. There's a biomass mill in uh, Medford here. But the environmentalists got on board when they saw that the fauna and the spotted owl were coming back to, back to life. And what's really good about this is Doyle testified before Congress. And Congress has written this little paper that I'm going to give to you. Would you please hand them out for me? Sure. And if you read it, what it says is Congress recommends the Apache County process to be the solution for all the western states to take back control of their roads and their wildfires. So Jeff brought Doyle Shamley to Oregon back in 2016. Okay, he saw four counties. One of them was Jackson County, I believe, but out of the four counties, Douglas County was the only county that seemed to be doing everything right. He met with Douglas County Commissioner Chris Boyce, Legislator Dallas Hurd, County Council Paul Meyer. During that presentation that Doyle did, and Doyle told me this himself, because I've worked with Doyle, um, he had to tell County Council to be quiet three times because he didn't know what he was talking about. When he got through with his presentation, Paul Meyer looked at him and said, you know, this might actually work. So what I'm also here to tell you is in 2012, we brought Doyle Shamley to Josephine County with Sheriff Gilbertson. We had had national, we were, I was working with another group called the National Constitutional Sheriff's Association. And... Uh, these books, the Property Clause, the RS-477, and Statehood are the books that Doyle and his researchers wrote, the same books that Utah is <coughs> to take their land back. They're suing for their land. Um, but at that time, nobody was interested in what Doyle had to say. The couple that owned the, the mill out here that just closed, yeah. they were there, but it didn't seem to make an impression. So, um, he has, he has been here. So what we did was um, rally around the flag. How many of you are familiar with rally around the flag? Okay, not very many. Uh, rally around the flag was put on by 
um, a group of 35 different organizations. Liberators is um, one of them, uh, one of the members. And we brought Doyle Shanley to Eugene last year. And uh, actually last, last June. And I had the honor to sit on the committee during Doyle's presentation, and so did you, Ron. We had uh, Herman Birchheiter there, I think, excuse me for not pronouncing his name correctly, and um, one of Lane County's commissioners there. And I know Doyle well enough that when he's doing his presentations and he asks a question, and a public official keeps saying, we can't, we can't, we can't, he will drop his head, and Doyle dropped his head several times during this because the two, we can't do this, we can't do that because the Fed won't let us. So what we did is we formed a jurisdiction committee and I was asked to do this presentation tonight, and you guys get a preview of it before the jurisdiction committee takes it to a public officials workshop, which I'm glad to see your county commissioner here tonight because he would be getting one of these books right here were he to come to the class that we're going to, to put on to educate our public officials as to what their jurisdiction is and what the federal government's jurisdiction is not. Um, so I have to kind of change things tonight to present it just to the common people rather than to the public official, but we do have a public official here, so I'm going to present it to you as well, I sir. Speak, I speak for your language. You speak for our language. Uh, okay. Government language. I lost a lot of that. Alrighty, so there's three things you're going to learn tonight. Number one, you're going to learn about the constitutional mandate Congress is and has been violating for years. Where Congress and federal jurisdiction really is. And what Congress's Natural Resources Committee's recommendation is a solution to Western states to take back control of their forests and their roads. And as we go through this, um, I have numbered the frames, so I would ask that you kind of jot down on the paper, back of the paper that you have um, any questions you have, and at the end we'll answer them. So before we, before we start this presentation, I want you to forget everything you've learned and everything you've been told. I want you to pay attention to the facts of the presentation and think about how these facts can be applied to correct the problems you're facing in your county. So, this class is for a better understanding of what our founders intended for the federal government in holding land. So can the federal government lawfully hold land? Can it hold territory or land within our county or our states? So what is the supreme law of the land? Can anybody tell me? Constitution. Yes, sir. And it lies at Article 1, Section 8. And what you're going to see here is exactly where the red button. I got to turn it on, sorry. Okay. The red button here says what they can do to lay taxes and so on. But all, all duties and imposts and excise taxes shall be uniform throughout the United States. What it actually says at Clause 17 is they have jurisdiction where? What does this say? Such districts not exceeding 10 miles square. Where's that? Can anybody tell me? You're right. For what? <coughs> by sessions of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, which becomes the seat of government to the United States, and they can exercise authority all over places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state for what? To erection of forts, magazines, arsenals. Dockyards and dockyards. other needful buildings, absolutely. Or enclaves. Yep. Doesn't say state united in this anywhere. So the seven things I want you to remember here are where 10 miles square is, that they can only own land by sessions from the state. They have to accept it. They have to pay for it. And then what? Title is issued. But it has to be the acceptance for 
erections of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other meaningful buildings. So where are the territories? Anybody tell me? Or what is a territory? Territory was before we were state in Okay, a territory is a tract of land belonging to and under the dominion of what? A state or a prince. Territories of the United States would be Michigan, Territory of Michigan, or the Northwest Territory. These districts of country, when received into the Union and acknowledged to be states, did what? They lost the appellation of territory. We are no longer a territory once we become a state. So what is residual territory? That would be like the base in a Guam could be on by the military enclave. That's true. Guam, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. So the federal territory is lands remaining under federal title, secondary designations such as national parks, national recreation areas, national forests, wilderness areas, conservation areas, wildlife sanctuaries, and so on. Downs versus Bidwell says the question of territories was dismissed with a single clause applicable to territory then existing, giving Congress the power to govern and what? Govern and, govern and what? Dispose what of say? the property. You're right. Dispose. They're required to dispose of the property. So what does the property clause say about federal zones? Where are the federal zones? They divided between the following, the 12, 10 western states, all of them right here. Their common, the common heritage of these lands, as well as their common destiny, under the property clause, is recognized under the collective term, the federal zone. Not any designation by Congress or any of its agencies. regardless of their present secondary designation for some national act by Congress or executive action, these lands originated as federal territorial lands and remain subject to the dictate of the supreme law of the land located in the constitutional property clause. And this is uh, one of the books right here that Doyle and his group wrote called The Property Clause. It's got all of the, the case sites and everything that they have said about it. When we do the class, the public official will get the legislative jurisdiction book and they'll need each one of these books here. So they won't have any questions as to where they can go to define what the authority is. So what does the property clause really say? That Congress shall have the power again. Here's that word, those three words. What is it? Dispose thereof. To dispose of the land. They can have all the needful rules and regulations they want to make, but it's for one purpose, to dispose of the land to all property or territory belonging to them. And I just told you that, and that's exactly what this says here about what the property clause is. They can write all the, prop, all the needful regulations, even criminal law, family law and exemption from state taxes for persons residing on federal land. So what does the court have to say about the property clause? Can anybody tell me? Okay. Where did you go? The Supreme Court in Kleppe versus New Mexico outlined what it believes to be the parameters of federal property clause power over the federal zone. Power of infinite scope is exercised under the authority of the Constitutional Supremacy Clause. So they're using the Supremacy Clause in everything, but it's only for federal territory that they own. Forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings telling you right now there is no public lands and there is no national forest unless it's land that can't have anything done with it. Then it goes back to the state. I think I must be, okay. 
So under the express terms of the property clause, Congress is arguably constitutionally what? Regulated to the stature of a what? A common proprietor. I want you to remember this word, proprietor, because you're going to read it in some of the documents I'm going to give you tonight. They can make all the proprietary rules and regulations to do what? Dispose of the land. To dispose of the land. This reads like a trust. You could say that, yes. So why must territorial lands be disposed of? Because they can't own it. If Congress or any of its agencies are only a proprietor and cannot write law for the land they claim to own, why are we allowing them to keep us off of our lands? And why are we not using our natural resources therein? That's a good question. Yep. So why the Fed must dispose of land within the boundary of each state? Because as long as the land remains in the territorial pre-statehood condition, Congress can want. They can govern it, right? Okay, when the territory becomes a state, the land comes under constitutional protection, and the only power that Congress has over it is that which is delegated under the property clause. So, under the property clause, what? All Congress can do of is dispose of it make all the rules they need to, all the regulations they need to, to accomplish that disposal, right there. It, Congress is not a legislature over public lands within the state, it's only a proprietor. So why must the, the, um, the feds dispose of the land within the boundaries of the state? Because disposal of, of title in the land, it's not a sovereign act, it's a common proprietary act. Congress needs no sovereign legislative power or otherwise to dispose of that land. It's their constitutional duty. It's a mandate to dispose of all of the land within our borders. So what do federal zones betray? The citizen of the, of the state deprives them of possible property rights, either, either by purchase or any other way, because they can regulate you to death. Okay. The equal footing? It, it, you're close. It, it, it betrays the Enabling Act. And the Enabling Act is a power within the state that the states would other, otherwise not have. It's a piece of legislation by which a legislative body grants an entity which depends on it for authorization or legitimacy of power to take certain actions. For example, the Enabling Acts often establish government agencies to carry out specific government policies in a modern nation, like the BLM or Homeland Security. <clears throat> Or the FBI. And it infringes on state sovereignty because the states are sovereign over the federal government. <coughs> they call that the equal freedom clause. Yes. So there's 13 types, or there's three types of lands that the framer and framers and our framers intended Congress to have. Free state, free territory. For what? For creating states. Post-statehood public lands, where they have no authority except to dispose of the lands, but no one objects to disposing <coughs> our land. <coughs> lands within a state acquired by state legislative consent for specific uses. Here again, it must be ceded, paid for, title is issued. So what has judicial interpretation done to the property clause? Well, it it up beyond all recognition. Dennis, why is this doing that? Yeah, it's just moving all over the place. Well, you probably hit the button twice. Okay. Use the control. 
it's a destructive aberration of the constitutional equation that's akin to a speeding train ready to run off its track. Every consequence is yet to be known, and it will not, it will not be conducive to freedom that we want at a great price, or our forefathers did for us. Pardon me? Can you move forward so you can read? Well, I can read it from here. It's just it's long. Okay, I got I got 47 frames to go through, so I'll I'll try to <laughs> let me know if you're not getting it. So two more cases that uh, and these are footnote cases from the Bill Howell book on uh, the factor, which is another book that he wrote off of the property clause, defining it more. <clears throat> Two more cases that Congress must dispose of the land. I don't know why it's doing that. I must be shaking, sorry. Under Butte City Water versus Baker, federal land laws under the property clause are not of a legislative character in the highest sense of the term, but savor somewhat of a mere of mere rules prescribed by an owner of the property for disposal, caretaker, or holding it in trust. I am not even. Okay, can I use this? Yeah. Okay. As long as it's plugged into the, as long as you've got the, take that. Well, I don't have enough room unless I take this out. I'm technically challenged, guys. Don't even go there, brother. I'll fire you. Can't fire them. Can't fire them because that's not a volunteer. Okay. <laughs> now, which, this is forward. That's fine. Okay. So, what Boyle versus Smith said, yeah, here we go. Huh. Sorry. Relax. So far as it relates to public lands within a new state, federal power amounts to nothing more or less than rules and regulations respecting what? The sale and disposition of public lands. And here again, they got to dispose of it. They can all write all the NEPA rules they want, but only to dispose of the land. And Abraham Lincoln said, nothing should ever be implied as law which leads to absurd or unjust consequences. Amen. So now we're going to talk about the Supremacy Clause. Are Congress's acts, regulations, and, aid, and its agencies, policies, and procedures in pursuance of the Constitution today in regards to our land? What are they? Well, let's see what the... <coughs> under, the under the Supremacy Clause, it only applies under the authority granted to the government under the Constitution of the United States. It grants the powers outlined in the actual text of the Constitution nothing more. All other powers are delegated to the states or to the people under the Tenth Amendment. And this is where I'm supposed to ask my brother a question. So where, so, so how does the Supremacy Clause apply? I didn't want you to feel left out. Okay, we're going to talk of what dispose of means. Well, Webster's Dictionary says that it's to part with, to alienate, as the man has disposed of his house or removed. To part with another, to put into another's hands or power. To give away or transfer by authority. Congress shall have the power to what? To dispose of the land and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory belonging to the United States. And nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claim of the United States or of any particular state. So can anybody tell me what seated means? Separate. They seated power by when you were created the state, the federal government seated the territory. It means to surrender or give up. Congress adopted a resolution in 1780 affirming its intent that all lands ceded to it shall be what? Shall be formed into district Republican states. And they, those states will have the same rights of sovereignty, freedom, and independence as the other states. 
that these ceded lands shall be granted and disposed of for what? The common benefit of all the United States. That disposal of lands would occur. The United States shall guarantee the remaining territory of the said states, respectively. So what is superseded? Nobody knows. To set above, to make void. Coming in by coming in place of, to set aside, to render unnecessary, or to suspend. The effect of passion is to supersede the workings of reason. <laughs> Nothing is supposed that can be superseded, that can supersede the known laws of natural motion. If you step off a roof, what's going to happen? Fall. You're going to get hurt. To displace or render unnecessary as an officer is superseded by the appointment of another. So where is the guarantee clause? It's in Article 4, Section 4, and what does it say? The United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government. Form of government under the guarantee clause would be hollow without meaning if there was not also a concomitant right of Republican self-governance. The guarantee clause guarantees a right of state Republicans self-governance. The claims clause, and it's entirely consistent with the original object of the claims clause. The claims clause presumes to secure a right to sovereign state self-governance through each state's territory. The guarantee clause presumes to guarantee the form that government, while at the same time implicitly confirming that right. New states can be admitted by Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of legislatures of the state as well as Congress. So is the state of Jefferson going to fly? Because you're going to have to have Oregon's permission and Congress's permission to form a new state. They're in life's problem. Yeah. So more on the claims clause. Nothing in the Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or any particular state. In October of 1780, Congress adopted resolution affirming its intent that all lands ceded to it shall be formed in Republican states. We gave Congress all the land within our borders. And I'm here to tell you, in Oregon, we got six propositions. Those six propositions, the first 13 colonies didn't get. Those six propositions, and this is our own research, Liberators 11 went to the state archives. This is the book where we did the state, we did the research at the state archives to find those six propositions. What the legislature was supposed to do with those six propositions was to give, a, to give it to the people in the state to vote yay or nay on. Did not happen. So we entered into the union, Oregon entered into the union on an unequal footing. So there again, we show the state shall have the same rights of sovereignty and freedom and independence as the first 13 colonies, that the ceded lands shall be granted, and what? Disposed of for what? The common benefit of the United States. Such regulations shall hereafter be agreed upon by the United States in Congress that what? Disposal of the land would occur as a symbol. As a symbol and that the United States shall guarantee the remaining territory of the states, respectively. <coughs> so what does the Claims Clause provide to the states? Can anybody tell me? It's a protective wall. 
for state, territor territorial sovereignty, and jurisdiction. So under the Admissions Act, and does anybody know where it's located? Well, it's located in Article 4, Section 3, Clause 1. And it says, New states may be admitted by, by the Congress into the Union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state. We just went over this. Or formed by the junction of two other states without, again, the, the consent of the legislature of the state and Congress. <coughs> But what is this power to admit new states? It is not to admit, is it not to admit a political, or, political organizations which are less or greater or different in dignity or power from these political entities which constitute the union? It is, as strongly put by counsel, a power just to admit states, and that's Coyle versus Smith. So what is the Admissions Act? Well, we just said that. It's, a, it's, it's an act written to admit new states to the Union. And why was it written? It was written to protect states. Can I add a little more? The Admissions Act? Okay. It, yes, so that we could enter into, into an equal footing with the rest of the state, the rest of the states. There is something <clears throat> I can read here. There's a, there's a court case that explains this in some respects. Little, would you stand up, please? <laughs> Talk a little loud. Thank you. Okay. This, uh, and it's, it states, the states between each other are sovereign and independent. They are distinct and separate sovereignties, except so far as they have parted with some of the attributes of sovereignty by the Constitution. They continue to be nations. Understand that, nations. Individual countries in a compact with the, with the, uh, in the by making the Constitution and creating the federal government, it made a compact. <clears throat> right? They continue to be nations with all their rights and under all their national obligations and with all the rights of nations in every particular. It's the same as France or Britain or any of the others, except we have a federal government to protect us. All right? It says, except in the surrender by each to the common purposes and objects of the Union under the Constitution, the rights of each state were not so yielded up, remain absolute. That's the Bank of Augusta versus Earl. That was in 1839. So what's the federal government required to do under the Admissions Act? Dispose of the land. So what is the equal footing doctrine? That new states under the equal footing doctrine are what? They're entitled to the same with respect to the land within their borders. Can judicial interpretation change this doctrine? No. Nope. It's not supposed to. Well, the answer to that question is given to us by another court, and it's Harcourt versus Gilliard. Each former colony declared itself sovereign and independent under, according to the limits of its territory, that the soil and sovereignty within their acknowledged limits were as much theirs at the Declaration of Independence as it is right now. And that court case that I just read confirms that. <clears throat> Even with the new states, even though they weren't the original 13 colonies, even though they weren't become, they didn't become independent and sovereign prior to the, uh, the construction of the Constitution or the Articles of Confederation, which created the United States of America, they have to give them the same same uh, power <coughs> as those original 13 states. Otherwise, they don't enter the union under equal footing. The Equal Footing Clause has long been held to refer to political rights and to sovereignty. That's United States versus Texas, and that's 1950. <coughs> so what does the Equal Footing Doctrine promise? 
control over all the sovereign land within our external borders in our states and in our counties. It's ours, not theirs. That's what the equal footing doctrine guarantees. So what is state territorial sovereignty? Wikipedia, sovereignty is understood in jurisprudence as the full right and power of a governing body to govern it itself without any interference from outside sources or bodies. That includes environmental groups. When those environmental groups step in and they start lobbying your county commissioners, that's harassment on you. They damage you. They're liable for those damages and that's what needs to happen. We need to start suing the board of those environmental groups on a personal basis and take everything they own. This stuff will stop. Yes? Yeah, I was going to ask a question. So since mining districts were here before uh, this was a state, they were the only sovereign governments here because they were formed as a self-regulating body, meaning that the miners regulated themselves. Mm -hmm. What's the question? The question is, is would that make uh, the mining district on equal footing clause? Is no, once the, state's, once the state's created, then the, then all that, if there wasn't federal land held. Right, the, the government right now is like, yeah, like a library district or uh, a education <coughs> district or, or an agriculture <coughs> district. But see, you were operating, the, the mining were operating in a territory controlled by the United States government before we became a state. Once the state is formed, it becomes a sovereign nation on its own right. Right. So if they don't hold land inside, see, the, 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 when you're mining, you're usually mining on, on well, they some gave, federal they, land. They, no, they gave that land to, the, uh, to a trust, and that trust is held because uh, they don't own the land anymore, they disposed of it. The mineral lands have been disposed of. They were disposed in a trust for a person to come in the future and file on them, and then they become you're talking a about You're talking about the Mining Act. I'm talking about the Mining Act. Well, the Mining Act, understand this. Once, once it, the, the only reason why that Mining Act has any force and effect inside this state is because that land is still held by the federal government. Right, and they disposed of it. Uh, no, they didn't the dispose of it. They, they disposed, disposed of the mineral estate. No. That's right in the law. If the they disposed of it, they wouldn't be controlling it. But the thing about it is, it's not they disposed. Don't need it. It's not disposed. You have to understand it's not disposed. Until it's disposed, once it's disposed, there's title created. Right now, right. there's no we'll title. There's we'll no title. We have what they call possessory title. No. By the I'm on. sorry, there's, no, there's nothing in law, yeah, nothing that I know of. Wait a minute, let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's and nothing in law that I know of, all right, that says that that land belongs to anybody but the federal government. I don't care if you guys mine it or not. They write the rules of which it, that land is mine. Well, it's, but the title is not created until that land is transferred to private ownership or the state. That's when title is created. There is no title to that land in the federal government. You go look that land up, there's no title. Yeah, there is. I've actually looked it up. I actually got a title to it. I have a trust title. It's, it's the registration of the claim with the county and the federal government. Okay, you it's, a, it's, a, the it's, a, it's not a, it's, it's a claim. No, it's a trust number. Okay. 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 But what you're learning is the real thing the federal government has to do with the land is dispose of it. Okay. Uh, is a sovereign state and exercising through the medium of an organized government independent sovereignty and control over all persons and things within its boundaries. That's American jurisprudence. The Constitution protects state sovereignty for the benefit of the individuals, not the states or their government. That's New York versus U.S. And that's 1992. So we're going to continue. American Jurisprudence 16 says that the sovereignty of states are the original 13 states that existed prior to the adoption of the federal constitution and before that time possessed all the attributes of sovereignty. 
all these attributes except those surrendered by the formation of the Constitution and the amendments thereto have been retained. Sovereign power of the states is necessarily diminished to the extent of the grants of power to the federal government in the Constitution and it is subject to the restraints and limitations of the Constitution. So again, new states, they what? They, they, they become vested with equal rights and are subject to only such restrictions that are imposed upon the states already admitted. There could be no restriction upon any state other than the one prescribed on all the states by the federal constitution. There could be no state of the union whose sovereignty or freedom of action is in any respect different from that of any of the other states. And the state, by contracting with Congress, is in no way bound by such a contract, however irrevocable it is stated to be. The subject to the restraint and limitations of the federal constitution, that the states have all the sovereign powers of independent nations over all persons and things within the respective territorial limits. Again, American jurisprudence, in their own words. And let me tell you, if you've read that book in their own words, that book's another one like this, and it's this thick. And it's court cases. <clears throat> so, I have some handouts for you. Would you like to hand these out? Sure. These are going to surprise you. We're going to go over these. Wait a minute. Hold on one second. I think that. Yeah, well, that one's mine. I can't give you mine. I won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> if we were in if we were in the actual class for the public officials, you would be getting a citizen's rule book and the constitution of the which is the constitution of the United States, resolving contrivy, which are one of the books up here for the property clause of the Constitution. And under the Northwest Ordinance, federal territorial governance ceased upon statehood. It left Congress as a common proprietor, remember that word, over residual territory remaining in a new state as public land. A proprietor over public lands in the new state, Congress is burdened under the property clause with a specific and affirmative constitutional duty to what? Dispose of the land. Dispose of the land under regular proprietary rule and regulations. That again is Pollard versus Hagen. So what I would be talking to you about if you were a public official in this book here is the, uh, the Weeks Act, which is in this book. And let me tell you, the Weeks Act is one of 36 acts and regulations the U.S. Forest Service uses for capital improvement and maintenance and land acquisition. And the first one that they talk about here is the Weeks Act. So at page three of the Weeks Act, it is the act of March 1st, 1911. And it's an act to enable any state to cooperate with any other state or states or with the United States for what? For the protection of the watersheds and navigable streams and to appoint a commission for the acquisition of lands. So being enacted by the state and this House of Representatives, and that's on this page right here, which would be in the book. This is the second paragraph of the Weeks Act. It says that the House of Representatives of the United States and America and Congress assembled that the consent of Congress of the United States is hereby given to each of the several states of the Union to enter into any agreement or compact not in conflict with stop right there. The Weeks Act, in and of itself, we're going to do with them all. Oh, it's in my hand, of course. And all of these acts here violate what? What are we talking about tonight? The, the, the forward acts. If they're mandated to dispose of the lands, can they control the watersheds of our navigable streams? No. 
No. Why are they? Because they're in conflict. Because we're it's in conflict. It. You're absolutely right. Well, the reason they're giving, the reason they're giving is because they do have control over the navigable waters downstream. What does navigable mean? What was what is intended to mean? It was intended to mean for well and for use. commerce, right? Commerce. It was for commerce, for transferring of goods up and down the rivers. Why right? down the river? Also road. access for the military and that sort of thing. Well, here's a here's a court case that kind of covers this. <clears throat> There are other other powers granted to Congress outside of Article One, Section Eight, that may become wholly superfluous, as well as uh, as well due to our distortion. This is part of the court case. Distortion of the Commerce Clause. Now we've certainly seen that, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. All right. For instance, Congress ha has plenary power over the District of Columbia and the territories. See U.S. Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, Clause Seventeen. <coughs> And Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. The grant of, com of comprehensive legislative power over certain areas of the nation, when read in conjunction with the rest of the Constitution, further confirms Congress was not ceded plenary <coughs> authority over the whole nation. So they don't have control over the whole nation. They don't have control over the lands of which they hold here because they are supposed to do what? Well. Disposal. And this was in Lopez Super. Okay. In the handouts that you would be getting as a public official, you would have the contrite book, and I would be asking you to turn to page 25. It talks about federal territorial governance, that it ceased upon statehood, and that as a proprietor, Congress is burdened under the property clause to dispose of the land. And it would have also the court rulings to support this. <coughs> we already talked about um, the Weeks Act. There's something else I'll throw in here real quick while you're looking at this. Okay. There's a, um, under United States versus Bevins. Now this case was, um, this, this has to do with jurisdiction, and, and it also has to do with uh, ports and federal waterways. The Cape court case was, a, was, there was a murder committed on a warship. Well, it was in Boston Harbor, in Boston, Massachusetts. The defense claimed that the federal government didn't have any authority to prosecute this case, that it was a state case. Well, this is what, this is what the federal attorney admitted in open court. The exclusive jurisdiction which the United States had in, in uh, forts, dockyards, ceded to them, key word, ceded to them, is derived from the expressed assent of the states by whom the sessions are made. It could be derived in no other manner, because without it, the authority of the state would be supreme and exclusive therein. They just admitted that unless that land is ceded to them, they don't have any authority over it. They don't have any authority over it in these lands that's not ceded to them. Okay, this is Oregon Revised Statute 272.050, and it would be on page 4 of the book. It created a Board of Forestry Conservation with two county court commissioners, supervisors appointed by the governor, to approve acquisition for national forests. Before approval by such board of the acquisition of any tract, the consent of the county court of the county wherein such a tract or any portion thereof is situated must be given by an order duly made and entered into the record of such court and a certified copy thereof transmitted to the board. Is there such a critter in the state in the county of Jefferson? No. We've already talked about the legislative jurisdiction diction book over the federal areas, and now I'll tell you what it is. This book, this book right here, gives the appearance that the federal government is doing what it's required to do, when in fact it's not. And it was commissioned by President Eisenhower, 
He appointed a committee to resolve at that time, which is 1965, the court of jurisdictional stat the conflict of jurisdictional status problems with the federal agencies and their inventory of the property in each state. And I would direct you to page 10 of the book. Gives the authority objectives, definitions, public domain, gives agency names by state and, and acreage of each state. So we know, where is federal jurisdiction? The tens of square miles. And? And, and all the docks and... Yeah. And it's also at Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, 10 miles square. And at page 5, there's an inventory report on jurisdictional status of federal areas within the states composed by the committee at Title 40, USC 255, 250, uh, 50, USC 175 has been amended to 40 USC 3111 and 3112. It's the development and history of legislative jurisdiction. We've already talked about the indignation suffered by the people from government agencies. What does that sound like? Yeah, and it was to, again, impart clarification on jurisdiction. So the real purpose of the Eisenhower report, again, was the real property owned by the U.S. And it lists the land in each state owned by the U.S. or its agencies, contractors, or corporation. It lists legislative jurisdiction over those federal areas of real property reported from each county in Oregon, General County of Service, and that whole inventory is in this book if you were a public official coming to the class. It also lists the types of jurisdictions, codes, descriptions in each county, Oregon, and its state statutes. There's a whole bunch of footnotes. Still requires session from the states, approved by Congress for the purpose of being legitimate by the Attorney General of the United States. So in other words, the governor recommends a piece of property to be sold to the United States to go straight to the United States Attorney General. He qualifies it. Where does he qualify it for? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Art, uh, forts, magazines, dockyards, and other needful buildings. That's what it has to qualify for. And then he sends it to Congress. Congress accepts. Money's paid to the state for it. Title is issued. That's the process. So what it means is the federal government does not have actual legislative jurisdiction except where a sessions, which is required agreement and defined purpose as can only be designated by the Attorney General of the United States if jurisdiction has been granted. It's got to be ceded. They've got to own title to it. And the state has to form the own force. Yep. So now we're going to talk about proprietarial interests only as their big gun in their arsenal. It attempts to legislate for and bar people from nearly half of the country. States within each prop with within which each property exists, all the same jurisdiction that would be applied if a private person owned the land. The key here is that the state cannot impose regulatory power directly upon the federal government or tax these lands. It means in order to effectively restrain federal entities, we cannot simply tell them what they can do. Instead, we must tell them what it is we will let them do. We can't regulate them, but it doesn't mean we have to give them permission to enter our lands and operate upon them. That's your county commissioners and that's your sheriff in concert together. You don't want them here, they don't come. Remember, remember the powers of the sheriff? Yeah. Okay. Sure. The sheriff tells tells the, the FBI, when the FBI comes into the county, check. they say, you got to check with me. Right? Because they cannot enforce federal law inside the state unless a, 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 the sheriff says they can. We have to give them permission to enter and operate upon we're, our lands. We're a sovereign nation. Yeah. That was the whole principle. The principle was to keep the federal government from imposing its will upon the states. So they just went around it. Now they're buying us for their own money. So, and one of the big things people are talking about, Fred Kelly Grant will talk to you about coordination. Coordination is not the big thing. Cooperation is. And how does the county get to cooperation? How do they become lead agency? They write the resolution under health, safety, and welfare. They write the ordinance. They call everybody to the table. The federal government is required to cooperate at that point. 
Until then, coordination ain't gonna do anything but make Fred Fred Kelly grant money. It's not gonna do a thing for the county. There's something very important here. So what I just what I just said is what she just said. Because they're they, they want to control what we do. And they have all this vast resources of which they they say they control and they own. Right? So what do they do? They cut those resources off for us to be able to make that money for ourselves and give us welfare. Of which, which the counties take woefully because now they're starving. They were used to having this income. Now we're being starved out. So then they offer us welfare. All right? What ends up with the welfare? It starts to shrink, doesn't it? Therefore, starving the rural counties out. Yeah, the intentional dependence. Yes. And well, but there's even a more there's even a more devious thing going on here. They want us out of these rural counties. They want us out of the rural counties and they want us in the cities. Because we're easier to control there. And if you don't think that's not happening, you just look around, and that's exactly what's happening. So without this cooperation, it is them who cannot act. This county and these states have near infinite ability to act. I would take you to the Eisenhower synopsis footnotes on page 9 of 16. It's the rulemaking and enforcement authority, which is another big issue with the states. Um, and that's where it refers, refers to the General Services Administration for assimilated, the Assimilated Crimes Act to treat lands under federal jurisdictions as if they were international lands. They can write all the laws, acts, policies, and mandates they want does not, however, give them authority to do so on any land not lawfully ceded to them. No federal agency has the authority to enforce land laws upon lands within the states other than ceded enclaves, except where cooperation has been obtained from the state or from the county in doing so. And when the county does that, they volunteer you into their jurisdiction. Page 12 of the synopsis. And point three here is the single most valid. When the purpose of such authority is clearly no longer being adhered to by the federal government, such authority can be undone. This means that the intentional misuse and negligence of the federal government over our forest lands does in fact open them up to legal suits. Some of that's already happening. Yeah. And the denunciation of their authority over said lands. If you've got a proprietor taking care of your business and doesn't take care of your business, get rid of me. Yeah, what's going on in Utah? Yep. Okay, here's the first thing that we're going to go over. And this is the legislative jurisdiction over areas within the states. Off here to the right are the codes, right here. One is an exclusive legislation or exclusive legislative jurisdiction, concurrent jurisdiction. Get back there. <coughs> Sorry. Um, partial legislative jurisdiction. All of these you can read for yourself. The one I'm concerned about, once you to understand, is proprietarial interests only. And it means that they have not obtained, the federal government has not obtained any measure of the state's authority over the area. It has, it has many powers and immunities not possessed by ordinary landholders with respect to areas in which it acquires an interest. All its properties and functions are held or performed as a governmental, governmental as governmental rather than a proprietary, rather than a proprietary capacity. So here you have a citation of legislative authority. You have a state statute. You have a federal state statute at large. Under the state statute, you're going to find the year of enactment, the, the cited statute, the page number and the volume of state law, and the chapter or equivalent number of that state law. That has to be, or they don't own it. Under federal statutes, it's by a reservation of an enabling act authorizing statehood. It'll show the volume and page numbers in the statute at large. And there will also be an acceptance or recordation date, which is the month, day, and year in which the federal government accepted legislative jurisdiction. Okay, let's turn to the second page. Up at the top, I want you to pay 
attention to this little tiny frame up here under the word jurisdictional. And that is the jurisdictional code. Over here to the right is the state statute section. Federal law or the state statute. The last one is the acceptance of recordation date. Okay, this first page that you're going to see, and I've highlighted it for you, says multi-county installation agriculture forest service, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you remember on the first page, what was number four? Proprietary interest only, correct? Okay, this is a list of the 13 national forests in the state of Oregon they claim to own. What's the number four? Is there any state statute? No. no. Any U.S. statute? No. Acceptance or recordation date? No. Okay. Look down at, at Winnema. I don't, I don't know what, uh, is it Siskiyou National Forest or Rogue River National Forest? It's in Josephine County. Yes. Okay. Well, if you look down just below this, you'll see the Interior Bureau, Bureau of Land Management, public do domain. How many millions of acres? Wow. wow. So then you add up all the acres under the forest. How many acres is that? There is one National Park Service, and that's Crater Lake, was ceded to them. And that's because it was donated, so the legislature had to cede the land. And there were two dates on that. 1915, there was an acceptance of uh, the land. So it is. it has been ceded to them. I don't know, Dennis and I argue about it, but... Uh, I just, my argument is, they had no authority to accept the land. The state even has questionable if they can accept the land. Um, but the point is, it was it was accepted and it was ceded. So getting the land back into private hands would be problematic at this. But I, I personally don't think they had the authority to accept it. Yep. So on, on the third page, you see Josephine County, I've got framed there for you. Yep. How many fours do you see of proprietary of jurisdiction? What are they? You have the Bureau of Land Management, the Scaling Shack, National Park Service, Oregon Caves, National Monument, no. Post Office, the Legislative, one, Federal Aviation Agency, Sexton Mountain Beacon, Grants Pass Beacon, for a total of how many acres that they control? 522 acres. Wow. And even the U.S. Attorney's Manual agrees with this on the territorial maritime jurisdiction. That where Congress reserves such jurisdiction upon entry of the state into the Union, prior to February 4, 1940, Congress acquired the property for a purpose enumerated in the Constitution with the consent of the state. Congress acquires acquired property, whether by purchase or eminent domain, and we disagree with eminent domain, and they received a session of jurisdiction from the state. Congress, so where Congress acquired the property and or received the state's consent or session of jurisdiction after 1940 and has filed the requisite acceptance. If they claim to own it, they've got to have title to it. Yeah. So what this all leads to is, um, let, me get, let me get back here. This leads to a workshop with Doyle Shamling. Um, our commissioner, sitting commissioner, Chris Boyce, and at that time candidate Gary Leaves in November went to Apache County, Arizona. Okay, four counties in Apache County, Arizona are doing the same thing. That's five counties now since 2011, I think, is when they started. Six years, guys, five counties are now doing the same thing. There's been no suits, no nothing. The environmentalists have got on board. Once it happens here, 
and the, and the spotted owl comes back, guess what? The fauna is going to come back, and so on and so forth. So what this is going to lead to is this is going to lead to a workshop <coughs> with Royal Shamlin, and it's going to entail two eight-hour days total. This is for our public officials. It's, you're going to have a detailed analysis of the predominant agencies, acts. The enabling act is going to be covered in detail. You're going to have rules. The CEQs from the Council on Environmental Quality. You're going to learn all the, the congressional acts, the PEOs, which are presidential executive orders, whether or not they're lawful. Court rulings along with a substantive commentary course. Now, mind you, and you're going to, thought, you're going to learn the, ne the necessity of disposal and technical land terms. Doyle testified before Congress. I have his testimony. The Natural Resources Committee is the one that he testified from. They have come out and said, by what you have in your hand, that this is the solution for the western counties to take back their fire burns and control of their roads and their forests. So, the question at hand is, can our counties afford to manage our lands? Or can we afford not to manage our lands even at the state level? Action without knowledge is fatal. That's why we always lose. Knowledge without action is futile. <clears throat> Inaction produces no results. So, what have you learned today? We're on the right track. <laughs> why is this room not full? <coughs> Really. And Commissioner, how will you apply what you've learned today to create solutions in your county? I'm not calling Gary Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> you should. I, I know Gary. Yeah. You know Gary. Yeah. I would. I would call Gary and, and ask him asking what he learned down there. Sure. So questions, answer time. Yes, sir. When the federal government is is required to dispose of land. Can they sell it to China? Can they sell it to some other country? Well, I guess I guess they probably could, but um, I I think there'd be so much back, public backlash that oh, they, they, would be, I mean, they wouldn't want to do that. But yeah, I, I suppose they could. But the intent, if you go to the intent. The intent of this country was for private land ownership. And the reason for that is because how do people prosper without yeah, property created? I mean, the very first property we own is what? Our bodies. Later, as our minds develop, our ideas. That's why they had patent laws and so on and so forth. Right? So when you take these things into, into, into consideration, land ownership and the ability to mine the land, or plant what you want on the land, grow crops, whatever the case may be. All of that was so that the American people could prosper. And the reason why we became the greatest country on the face of the planet that has ever been known is for that reason, private property ownership and laws that support that. So the reason why they put the, that property clause in there was so that land would move into private ownership. So that, that those people could prosper and gain wealth. Which did what? Well, and, and retain right. sovereignty. Well, that, that's part of it. But it's, I mean, it covers a broad well, a big, uh, area. A but the point question. being is, it, what does it do? It lifts the entire country. When we prosper, what do we do? It raises the prosperity of the people who are poor up below us. Because now we've given, either given them jobs or whatever the case may be. Right. So that was the purpose of it. I was just wondering, you know, like for instance, right now, we know Oregon is rich in resources, and if we go to the federal government and say, hey, you've got to dispose of this land, we can't assume that, that you know, what the federal government is thinking, they'll tell sure, we'll sell it to you, the, the, the inhabitants of Oregon, people in there, or companies in Oregon. They can just say, sure, we'll do what you want. Well, see, the thing because there's a lot of countries that really want that resource. Yeah, resource. yeah but the, see, the thing about it is, <clears throat> it's held within, within, where's the city? It's sitting inside the external borders of the, of the state of Oregon which is really has superior authority to the, to the federal government. Because it's supposed to be given to them to begin with. Right. 
So, so could the state tell the federal government? No, that's exactly right. Control. The state could tell the federal government, no, you're not. Okay. You're either going to homestead that land out as you should have done in the, in the beginning, or you're going to turn it over to the state so we can do it. One or the other. But you have to have the state willing to do that. Makes sense.